and the National Intelligence Agency says the government should continue to appreciate Nigerians who have played significant roles in nation building through positive global representation. The NIA Director General Ahmed Rufa Abubakar disclosed this at a meeting to honor retired Nigerian career ambassadors in Abuja. Arise correspondent Punari Ma Benjamin Telsosma. At this meeting to honor Nigerians in the diplomatic service who have distinguished themselves in outstanding and exemplary ways before retirement, there is a call for the government to continue to support those promoting the country's diplomatic and foreign engagement. Majority of their words were given posthumously to those who served the nation but received by family members and friends. My dad died, died um, exactly 55 years ago, so it's a great um, privilege that he's been remembered today, 55 years later. It's not often that you find them um, Nigeria, you know, recognizing people so many years after. So it's, um, it's, um, it makes me really happy. A top official of the Association of Retired Career Ambassadors of Nigeria is urging the country to emulate the virtues of these career ambassadors who have sacrificed for the nation despite the challenges with foreign service. What we are missing out, partly leadership, partly values, partly the absence of mentors with integrity. Those are the real things we are, we are missing out. A key highlight of the event is their word given in honor of the founder of the National Intelligence Agency, Mohammed Lamidu Senussi, who is the father of the former Emir of Kano State. He is described as the father of the Nigerian Secret Service. For the NIA, this year's award are particularly special as the first and last directors of Directorate of Research Department, DRD, which is the precursor of the agency are among the awardees. And I'm talking about Ambassador M.A. Sanusi, who can be legitimately described as the father of Nigeria's external service, or rather, uh, or in other words, uh, Nigeria's secret service. And Ambassador Lamine Metedin, who led to raise the DRD and ushered in the era of the NIA. It is a great um, honor for me and for all the members of the families of those who have been honored today. Um, I have grown up in my life as a son of the Foreign Service. Many of the names that we see today are fathers to me. Many of those that are here are fathers well known to me. Uh, I still have fond memories of my father taking me to a papa to visit Ambassador Leslie Harriman. The retired career ambassadors say the recognition and words will help to build confidence in those Nigerians that are quietly and secretly serving the nation in the foreign service. Punarman Benjamin, Arise News. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined in the studio by the first vice president of the Association of Retired Career Ambassadors of Nigeria, Ambassador Joe Keshi, who is also Nigeria's former consul to the United States. Uh, so good to have you here. Uh, just tell us a bit before we go into general um, issues why um, it's been difficult for I mean, people who have served Nigeria very well in the foreign service to be known by, <laughs> even by the Nigerians that they, they served. Uh, way up until you had to decide to set up this group association of uh, I mean retired career ambassadors of Nigeria and then even trying to honor them because it looks like even the government that they serve had forgotten about them well that is the that is the honest uh, truth and uh, that also happens to be the underlying factor why we decided that we need to honor uh, these uh, gentlemen and more especially because uh, many of them uh, were mentored us in, in the service, and we can speak of uh, we can speak a lot, you know, about them and what they did to shape um, our career. But more especially because we also recognize that the country has not paid enough recognition uh, to these uh, men and uh, women who did tremendously, you know, who, who gave tremendous service to this country. Look, um, 
A foreign policy, Nigerian's diplomacy matured during the Civil War. And some of the people we honored this week were architects of that success, you know, abroad. A few of them are still uh, mm -hmm. alive in their 80s and their, and their 90s, but who remembers them? In fact, in a particular instant, um, a state was honoring its people. I actually had to plead. I'd, I'm not even sure that uh, <laughs> the, the gentleman knows that I was behind talking to the people in that state. That is this one of a prominent song. No, there's nobody in this with the kind of CV or personality that he has. But it was like, oh, who is see What are you know, <laughs> like So that. even those in, in authority don't in, know so those much in about authority him. don't uh, really know. So we just thought that, listen, we need to remember these people. We need to honor them in recognition, not just for the service, but also the fact that uh, they, they did a lot for, for us, you know, collectively and individually, but also to set example for some of the people in the diplomatic uh, service of Nigeria today that, look, this, this is a service with tremendous great history. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it has seen great men and women who helped to build this nation and that um, we, we want to use that to also inspire the people coming uh, you know, after us. Yeah, uh, much of the work that you usually do is done, you know, behind the curtains. Sure, sure. <laughs> and so sure. a lot of Nigerians don't know uh, so much about what you do. The Nigerian people. No, but no, no, no. But the leaders that they serve, the leaders we serve, they know. And so when it's time to do this, uh, uh, the, national this, uh, honor, this national honor, honor. No, nobody, nobody remembers them. I even know that. Uh, the permanent secretary, retired permanent secretary, they are say coffers. It's equally fighting that a lot of their permanent secretaries, you know, some of them very distinguished, have not been uh, recognized or honored in this country. And it's, it's also, you know, in some climate, as soon as you have become ambassador, you are appointed ambassador, carry ambassadors, you are given a national honor outright. For your service to the people. For your service. You know, uh, so. Okay. Uh, we hope um, that will continue to grow. But I was interested in one thing, uh, the NIA, the establishment of the National Intelligence Agency. Uh, well, I heard from there that it used to be a research department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs before it eventually emerged as a separate agency. I just want you to talk to us a little about that. Um, I, I think it was, uh, look, every nation has this... Uh, um, National Intelligence Agency, uh, and as of course, as we continue to grow, you know, um, I think it was in 1983, under the Babangida administration, that a, uh, a decree was signed, who created, I think, uh, both the NIA, the DSS, and I can't yeah. remember, you know, and um, so the, the the research department was you know, taken away from the ministry and um, it's grown tremendously, it's become a big agency, you know, uh, doing great uh, work for, for, the, for the nation. Um, it, it's important that we recognize the, you know, um, the work of the agency and why it is very important. There are two things. There are some information that diplomats can get. There are certain information that, look, we can't get. And so you needed these agencies uh, to be able to, um, uh, to do some covert um, operations. Operation. Not, well, not operations, really, but uh, <laughs> covert uh, sniffing around in order to be able to get. Of course, debriefing. Debriefing. So because you get these things in order to be able to uh, either protect your own national interests or it enables you to know what others are thinking, thinking. you know, and in that way you, you form a kind of broad policy mm -hmm. that, ena I mean, you, uh, yeah, broad policy that enables you to be able to defend your own national interest. Okay. Now let's go on to the politics of Nigeria. I mean, we've seen candidates, presidential candidates emerging and little has been said of their foreign policies. I mean, the bigger parties, uh, though campaigns are yet to begin, but, uh, what will you say about uh, the plans for their manifestos and so on, on, how they can properly size Nigeria up and get very good foreign policy input into that? W we I want to start with the assessment of them first before we get into that. Well, look, we've seen the, we've read a few on uh, of what they had to say about foreign policy, but 
The truth that we must recognize is that even in past elections, foreign policy did not feature much. And we at uh, ACAN, we're actually looking at how we can uh, bring foreign policy into the conversation. So we are strategizing among ourselves and we are trying to reach out to the top candidates. Um, again, uh, we do not have the resources to take how many <laughs> presidential candidates now? 17 <laughs> or? Yes. Look, you know, look, we are a serious organization and diplomats are always a serious people and we don't waste our time on uh, frivolities, on the yeah, frivolities and irrelevancy. So we are thinking of taking, bringing three, four, five of the top candidates if they will agree to come and have a conversation, not a debate, mm -hmm. have a conversation on foreign policy in the hope that we can, I mean, they, we can inject foreign policy into, you know, the conversation. Because everybody seems to forget that there's a nexus between foreign policy and domestic uh, policy. And that when they condemn our foreign policy, oh, Nigeria is not doing this, oh, Nigeria is not recognized, oh, the diplomats are doing this, it is because of what transpires or what is going on at home. If you have a very sound economy, if you have a very strong military, if you have values that people can be proud of and you pursue those values domestically, definitely you, you feel the confidence and you have the ability to be able to project those values into your foreign policy. And of course people will respect you. i give you a good example that i like to cite. You know, we travel extensively in this country looking for, <laughs> looking for foreign investors. But there are some countries they've never spent a penny to look for foreign investors. Why? Because they've created that environment that wherever you are, people, people just, I mean, uh, businessmen and women all over the world, once they know that they're making money in a country A and that the, the, the laws of that country, it's good. They respect international agreement. The economy is doing very well. The people are friendly. They will come. And of course, domestic investors, nationals, are investing in that economy. Mm. They would come. You don't have to waste your money traveling all over the and all of that. <laughs> all over the world. I, I can actually, let me just tell you this story for, to make the point. When I was in, in Atlanta, I took the governor, the then governor of Abia State, Ojikalu, to Alabama. And we went. The part of the lesson was to see the governor of, um, uh, the speaker of Alabama, you know, and we went, they were having a session. And when they had the break, he, um, uh, he came out and he said to us that, look, he can only give us five minutes. And that within that five minutes, he was also signing a document for his staff. Yeah. And then when he finished, he said, okay, where are you from? And then the governor started telling him. Now, there was a business partner of the governor who has just be, uh, gotten, uh, I think, about 14 million to do a vouch or something like that for all this uh, company. And in the course of discussing this, the Alabama man was introduced and uh, it was made clear, the man now told the governor that uh, he, he got so much so and that the boat or the but it's being built in Alabama. You know, the governor got out from his seat, walked across to Kojan. Where did you say you're from again? <laughs> <laughs> Almost immediately, yeah. the conversation changed. changed. From five minutes, we spent 45 minutes. Wow. So this is part of what, you know, so when you have a conducive env mm -hmm. environment, and in terms of dealing with the global world, the, the laws are respected. No, you sign an agreement today, as we've been saying, and tomorrow uh, you repudiate. Especially repudiates. when there's a change in yes, government. Yes, you repudiate the agreement and uh, nobody honors the agreement. No, nobody would come in here. Or, or there's insecurity in your country. And every time you open the website of uh, a lot of missions in Nigeria, go to their website. You see all the warnings yes. about coming Travel to Nigeria. Yes. So from if you are looking for where to invest. to the country itself. Yes. Somebody says, oh, Nigeria is a very rich country. You can make good money from Nigeria. And then you go to the website. 
You see what everybody has written. <laughs> you won't come. Because, okay. So now, uh, you haven't seen uh, the presidential candidates of the party starting from APC, the ruling party, uh, uh, Bola Chinobu, uh, PDP with Atiku Abubakar, uh, Labour Party with Peter Obi, and then, of course, uh, NMPP, Kwan Kwan So, and then it goes on with Abga and then other political parties. How do you think, uh, how do you measure them in terms of foreign policy, having engaged with them previously or had them previously? And how do you think? that uh, y your group uh, Arkan can help engage them to see the need to help rebuild the image of this country abroad? Well, that's what I said earlier, that we are having a conversation and I think we are going to reach out very soon to some of the leading candidates. Yeah, and but I'm see. interested in your own assessment yes. individually well, of this. Well, you <laughs> see, um, let's start from um, uh, the former Vice President Atikula Abubakar. I believe that he should have, in terms of foreign policy, some edge in the sense that he's been a vice president he's represented the president in a number of uh, international engagements and uh, he has friends also abroad so he understands and is very well at should be at home with the issues notwithstanding the fact that um, uh, the world which he operated in as vice president has changed dramatically you know and uh, and so on uh, in, in comparison between Tunumbu and, um, and uh, Obi, Tunumbu has traveled also extensively. You know, but when you look at the CV of both, Obi seems to have been one that has been more uh, involved in engaging the business community. So you probably see a, a situation that if you have an experience at Tiku because of his past uh, role, uh, you now have an OB with a business acumen that has that. I mean, a typical example of what he did the last time, which I think most people do did uh, miss on. Uh, they did not grab the the, the impact. He's going to Egypt. Yes, he's going <laughs> to. to the like yeah, he's this going to like Egypt. So you could see that if he becomes president, he's probably going to work with Egypt one way or the other in order to be able to see whether. We can benefit but from it wasn't water. a high-profile visit. Yes, if, yes. if we were to look at it diplomatically, no, uh, I mean the president he didn't visit the no, president. It, it doesn't have to. You see, this is the point. You don't have to visit the president, but immediately you become president and you signify your interest in uh, in uh, that thing. You will see the enthusiasm of the Egyptians too. But doesn't that say much about his uh, uh, diplomatic, I mean, foreign credentials? If he's going to such a country and uh, it's lower level officials that no, he's you meeting, see, one of, one of uh, the problems of leadership in this country that we must all recognize is limited exposure mm. of our leaders. And this, this is not just presidents or members of the house, it goes across board. And that is why I have this mantra I do say and joke with my friends, particularly my children. I keep saying, if you do not know what to do, watch television. If you watch television in a day, you learn a number of things. And so, if our leaders are properly exposed, very well exposed, very well knowledgeable, I, I honestly would believe that some of the things they do in this country, they will not be doing it. Okay, as we try to round off this conversation, uh, uh, let's talk about the ongoing chogom. Uh, a lot of Nigerians are wondering why we still are so much interested in this Commonwealth thing that we don't seem to be deriving a lot of benefit from it. President Buhari is currently in uh, Kigali at the moment, joining others. Uh, what, what do you think we can derive benefit from uh, this uh, issue of chogom? You know, we in this country we are we are very fond of saying we want to derive benefit benefit from everything we engage yeah, in. Because no. people already I, say I, that I, the I, president I, is uh, traveling no. too much. No, I, I think that what what I believe we should do with the Commonwealth is to return back to the Commonwealth that we knew of before. That was that was useful to us, particularly in the areas of uh, health and education. You know, a number of Nigerians benefited from the Commonwealth Scholarship. A number of Nigerians were trained in the health uh, sector, you know, by some Commonwealth funds. And look, they did a lot of things in, in, in you know, in those days. Now, I, I think that uh, the, the, the role of the uh, Commonwealth impact in, in Africa in particular is no longer being felt. And if they can go back to those days, that Commonwealth 
meant something to the people yeah, especially of Especially when it has to do with sanctions. I remember how they were helpful well, to I, Nigeria. I, yes, ensuring ex that exactly. they kicked against dictatorship, exactly. bad and, governance, and, and, and all now they're not even talking much about that. I've been listening to the, the speeches being made. Of course, it's the health session they went up when yeah, I was waiting. Yeah, the one on, uh, against malaria. You know, and but all but all I that. just believe that what they need to do is to take a look at what happened uh, you know, in the days gone by and try and recreate that um, relationship that connected us, you know, to, 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 to one another in the sense that, look, today, I believe that we need to do a lot in the area of education. We need to do a lot in the area of science and technology. Now, when we had independence and the Commonwealth was very effective, they did a lot in these areas. And I just think that if they go back to this, okay. it will become, again, people will see the relevance of the Commonwealth oh, at the okay. end of the day. And uh, finally, what will you say of President Buhari's uh, foreign policy engagement here and there? I mean, this government is going to be rounding off its second term next year. Well, that was very quickly, I, in 60 I, I, seconds. I How do you think it's fed? Well, I, I just think that, uh, you know, we, we <laughs> I think one of the things that uh, must be said, the truth of the fact that, uh, um, Nigeria as a country remains very much respected around the world. Again, because it's Nigeria. Now, but whether this regime has really projected the image of the country as success, or other regimes have done, and whether the president has been effective in engaging the rest of the world. Look, it, there's one thing for you to travel, which people don't realize. It's, it's not enough for you just to travel. It's enough that when you get in there, you make an impact. It is this lack of impact in all these travels and, uh, you know, I, I think because I was listening. I mean, our FDI I, has I, been I was, I was listening to, you know, um, your reporter who says that the president was supposed to make a speech yesterday or early this morning. He did not. He was supposed to speak on this malaria thing. He did not. Uh, nobody has said uh, what's, what the problem. Well, there was an official that eventually spoke <laughs> because we learned that. Exactly. Uh, so uh, the point okay. is, you know, They've, they've, they've maintained, they've done the best they can. That's a, all I can say, uh, you know. But <laughs> okay, very quickly. <laughs> We've know. seen the FDI plunging mm -hmm. under this government. in Nigeria's foreign, uh, you know. Uh, what, has, what has not plunged uh, under uh, this right. government? Well, we just hope to have policy. this conversation much more uh, another time. Because I really want to pick your... Um, what do you think about this government's success in terms of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs engagement? When he came in, there were lots of expectations of what he would do and not do. But unfortunately, it looks like we haven't seen so much happening. But we must thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador but, John but, Keshi. But, but, but I know before you sign also, I know you have yes. it, but you must also <laughs> understand that at the end of the day, oh. the president is a foreign me is really the foreign yeah, minister. Yeah, okay. Well, I've been told that we've, we've overshot <laughs> the wrong way. I'll bring you back Thank some you. other time to fully assess Thank the government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Joe Keshi, who is the first vice president of the Association of Retired Career Ambassadors of Nigeria and Nigeria's former consul to the United States. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Well, that's how it's been for this edition of the Arise interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. I'm Somna Sambo. Thank <laughs> you.